Tom Russell, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's a pleasure to, to finally meet you, to speak to you. Obviously, the godfather of rock or the beard of doom, whichever one you would like to be called. <laughs> but, uh, Both are equally embarrassing. <laughs> well, we'll maybe just stick with Tom. But uh, honestly, Tom, thank you for coming on. I know you're a busy man. Yeah, I'm busy myself. So it's good to, to get a little gap in your schedule that we can sit down and have a good blether about all things music um, for yourself, get your thoughts and opinions on lots of different things. But before we actually get started, Tom, how are you actually doing? I'm fine. Just before I tell you, I've got, I love that word, blether. It's, it's just one of the great old Scottish words, isn't it? A good old-fashioned blether. Yes, yeah, I'm doing fine. I, I, I took out... I was on holiday a couple of months ago and uh, came back and I had a, a, a problem, like a head really bad headache and it wouldn't go away uh, and so I went to the hospital and, and they were terrific and anybody that moans about the NHS I'll stand up and fight for them because the NHS were brilliant women. Was it, was uh, it I'm, not I'm, still, a- I'm still taking it easy a wee bit but uh, I'm on the mend. So uh, was it not just a hangover that you had? <laughs> no unfortunately <laughs> I've had one or two of them in my day. Um, no, this was different. This was uh, uh, they called it um, the, the the consultant said it was a thunderclap headache. I'd never mm-hmm. heard of a thunderclap headache, but he says oh, it's it's not common, but uh, we come across it occasionally. Maybe if it was ACDC, it'd be like thunderstruck headache or something. <laughs> I think maybe there's been too many loud concerts over the years has caused it. Might have been that, but uh, Tom, thank you for coming on. We're going to talk about all things music, um, but what I like to do with all the guests that come on is I like to go right back to the very beginning. So for yourself, where did you grow up? Kevin Tilly. Born, right, in, okay. born in Lennox Town, uh, Lennox Castle, which was a maternity hospital at, at, at the time back in uh, in the day. Uh, grew up in Kirkintilly. Nice. Happy childhood, only child. Uh, uh, good memories of my childhood. You know, see, from a very young age, were you uh, were you exposed to music from a very young age? Not massively so. My, my mother liked to, to listen to Radio Luxembourg at night, so I've got a memory of mm-hmm. me sitting doing my homework, probably seven or eight or nine years of age or something like that, and mum's got uh, Radio Luxembourg on while she's doing the ironing. So that's my, my earliest memory of music. So uh, what, age, what age, Tom, would you have been then when when you discovered your own musical tastes? And who were some of the bands and musicians that, that instantly you were like, I, I really like them? My first real introduction, my dad was a, a sales rep. Uh, he sold chocolate. He worked for Lint, the chocolate company. Uh, and he came home from work one night, and I think I was maybe 10, 11, something like I can't remember. Uh, he came home from work and he said to my mum, um, it was like a Tuesday night, he said to my mum, uh, Grace, um, I've got a couple of complimentary tickets I got from R.S. McCall, um, the, the sweetie shop. Yeah. Uh, I got on really well with the manager, S, and she gave me these two complimentary tickets. Do you fancy coming with me to a concert tonight? And I can, I can still remember my mum saying, oh, Jimmy, I've, I've been working all day. I've got a washing to do. I've got a dishes to wash. To wash. I, I, I can't be bothered. Why, why don't you take Tom? Right. So my dad says, do you, do you want to come, son? Aye, aye. They remember, we're talking about the, the 1950s, the late 50s, early 60s at this stage. Right. Um, so uh, going to concerts... It was unheard of. It was a really unusual thing. People went, people went to see pantomimes. People went to see the Five Past Eight show at the King's Theatre. But going to concerts was really quite unusual. So I went with my dad, and uh, it was the Odeon in Renfield Street in Glasgow, yep. which uh, they used to put bands, bands on occasionally, once in a blue moon, they would have a band on. And my memories of the gig was... Uh, you couldn't hear us. There's musicians up on the stage, and you couldn't hear a blooming note uh, because of all the screaming from the audience. Yeah. Uh, but then, every now and again, there was a surge of, of ladies, girls, women, running to the front of the stage and taking their bras off and throwing their bras on at the stage. And as I 
A young boy <laughs> just approaching uh, my teens. This was qu- had quite an effect on me. Yeah. Uh, and I thought to myself, this is the business I'd quite like to get in. <laughs> a woman <laughs> throwing her brushes at me. We, we uh, all. Uh, so it turned, the, the, the band was actually the Beatles. It was the Beatles that were playing at the, the Odeon. I think it was their first uh, first Glasgow show. They had played some other shows in Scotland and Alloa and up north and down in Ayrshire beforehand. But this was, I think, it was their first ever Glasgow show. And my dad was just done. He was just lucky to get these two tickets. So that was my first introduction uh, I, I didn't get heavily involved a, a good few years later probably when I went to uh, probably when I went to college and I started you know you started uh, it was an exciting time for music the, the 60s the early 60s uh, yeah there was just I'm, so much happening I mean exactly I suppose that would have been early on in the well relatively early for the Beatles but um, I mean what that's, a, that's quite impressive, like your, your first ever concert, you know, that I've asked everybody if normally when they come on and some people are a wee bit embarrassed because it might not be a, a great first concert. Mm. Some people probably lie because, you know, they want it to be something a bit better. But, mm-hmm. I mean, there's not many people can s- probably say they saw the Beatles. You know, they're just such a, a legendary band nowadays. Mm-hmm. And, um, in my opinion, probably one of, if not the most important band that kick-started a lot of things. Oh, yes, yes. Some, some of the, the, the songs, when you listen to them even to this day, the songs, the songwriting was incredible. And the, the, the influence of George Martin, the producer, uh, mm-hmm. he, he just pulled it all together. I mean, I've got some questions that will, that will kind of delve into that, kind of going back, but mm-hmm. um, give us a wee laugh. Do you remember... What the first? So that was your first concert. Do you remember what the first album or or single was that you bought with your own money? Yes, it was. Uh, I've got that in my book. Uh, I brought a book out a couple of years yeah. ago, The Godfather of Rock, um, and uh, the guy that helped me write it. He says, "Let's start at the beginning. Let's, you know, where were you? Just basically, you're 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 saying where were you born? Your your upbringing, introduction to music." And he asked me that question. And I thought, I can't remember. And it took me a couple of days, and then it finally clicked. And I can remember the shop I bought it, and it was Conlon's in Kirkintilloch, in the, the Cowgate in Kirkintilloch. Mm-hmm. Uh, Conlon sold radios and televisions, and they had a little section where they sold records. Yeah. And it was a seven-inch single by The Shadows, and it was called Apache. Right. Okay. It's not too bad, but I know, obviously... You, there's so much already out there about you, as I say. I know that there's your book as well, but I'm going to kind of fast forward a wee bit. So I know it was around the early 70s, which was when you started your first um, music store, your music shop. Yeah. And uh, was that in Kirkintilla? It was in Bishop Briggs. Bishop Briggs. fairly close to Kirkintilla. Um, the, the radio, it was such an exciting time, the 70s. The 60s was build, 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 build up, build up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but then the 70s, everything just exploded and the music was just uh, sensational. When, you, when, when you, you listen back to some of the, 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 the tunes from that, the whole era, um, and you listen to some of the modern music today, uh, yes, what? some of the modern music of today will, will live forever. I don't think is 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 the 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 they're as memorable as yeah. as as we had in the seventies. Well, we've got all this to talk about, and it's it's right down that sort of alley. But I know you started your first music shop, done it for a few years, got a wee bit of quite you know a bit of success with it, and then you progressed and you got a shop in Glasgow, or I think you eventually maybe got a few, but you started with a shop in Glasgow. Bishop Briggs was the first, yep. then Shettleton in Glasgow, then Mount Florida in Glasgow, near Hamden Park, and then Duke Street in Glasgow. And everything was going good and great, and then Sodge Lock happens. and you Supermarkets, but yeah. No, but before that, there was a robbery, and then there was a fire, and there was a flood in the different shops. <laughs> and but, um, just one minute you think you're doing great, and, and, and you've got luck. Uh, is, is on your side and then... there's, a, there's a story that always sticks in my mind and it was my dad told me so my dad was born in the in the 50s so 
he, you know, obviously went to high school, left, went and got a job. And so he would have been in the 70s, right around the 70s, early 70s when he was a young guy going out. And he always he always told me that he was uh, there was a music shop in Glasgow. And I don't know which one it was, but he said he would go there at lunchtime, you'd get paid and uh, you'd, flip, you'd be looking for the album that you were after, flicking through the records. And he says the coolest thing that you could do was you would purchase um, the record. And obviously back then, it's, it's you know records, it's the big, huge sleeves. Mm-hmm. He says the music T-shirts weren't a big thing back then, so he's, the coolest thing you could do is, is, is uh, get the album you wanted and you'd walk home and you'd be standing at the bus stop right under your arm and it was advertising to everybody this is who I like, yeah. and, you know, and, and it, that was the other thing he said back then, some of the music's different nowadays, and we'll talk about it as well, but uh, you know, the album covers back then were just cool, mm. you know, there was, because they had to be cool, they had to advertise the product mm. um, as much as the music did, and uh, some of his first albums, he was talking about getting like the Doors albums when they first came out, and the Beatles, Credence, The Who, all those sort of bands, like bands he grew up on. Mm. But he just says the coolest thing was uh, going into Glasgow, off to the music shop, get the album that you're after, walk home with it under your arm, stand at the bus stops, making sure everybody could kind of see it. He says nowadays you pop a band t-shirt on. He says it's the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, you're advertising, this is who I like listening to. Mm -hmm. Um, But obviously you've got the music shops in Glasgow and, you know, as, as you've already said, music back then, it was very, very different, um, you know, you had music shops back then, a lot of them have disappeared now, which is a, is a real shame, but how was it working, having your own music shop, was it what you expected? Um, I don't know what I expected, uh, all I knew was that uh, I'd done a few things before I opened the, the, the first record shop, I was in my mid mid twenty mid to late twenties I think when I opened the first shop in, in Bishop Briggs. Um so what I expected, I don't I don't know. Uh but it never made a fortune. Bishop Briggs isn't a, a huge huge place. I was a little bit nervous about going into Gl- the centre of Glasgow where the big boys were, you know, the big uh, yeah. record shops. I thought, oh, I've no chance competing against them. And that's why I sort of stuck to the, the outskirts. Um, so each shop turned a profit. But before all the disasters happened, and like the fire and the flood and the robbery and, and all that sort of stuff, and then the supermarkets started. Yeah. Uh, the supermarkets started just at the time when LP vinyl, rec- L- vinyl mm-hmm. albums um, were changing to CDs. So yeah. it was so much easier for the supermarkets to stock CDs. Yeah. They didn't take so much room up and they weren't so easily damaged on, on display. Um, so supermarkets, and, and that, that was the turning point. Uh, so I went back from four shops to three shops to two shops to one shop. Uh, that thing as well, though, that you say that, you know, you weren't sure what to expect. You weren't, you know, you, were, you weren't making a huge profit but you were doing something that you really enjoyed, I suppose. You know, money, money's, not, money's not everything. And um, get I, some. Get into your work, work at nine o'clock in the morning and been there for eight hours and be able to listen to anything. There's a new album, but as you say, Creedence Clearwater. There's a great old Stones album. I'm going to put that on. What, Zeppelin's got a new album out? Let's have a listen to that. Uh, all day. Eight hours a day. It was brilliant. It's weird, though, because as you're saying, that, that was your shop. You could put on whatever you wanted. I remember, yeah, I'm obviously uh, younger than yourself, but I remember probably 30, well, 20, 25 years ago now working in a music shop and it was right bang at the end of the, the 90s. And uh, it even changed, obviously, this was probably one of those stores that there was, it was a chain of them and you were only ever allowed to play when there was customers in the shop. It had to be something within the, the top five of the charts, and it was all with the pop music and that. So, it's it's my uh, my my girlfriend always laughs at me because I, there's some terrible pop albums that I know the lyrics inside out because I heard them on loop for for five months solid. She's like, "Hey, I'm a rock guy." She's like, "How do you know this sort of stuff?" And I'm like, "Well, <laughs> here's the story. I, I'm not a, I, I'm not a secret steps fan, honestly." <laughs> 
five, six, seven, eight. I know. But um, I was watching an interview you'd done, and what you'd said on it was, back then, a lot of the record companies, when they were going to be advertising a new band, a new artist, maybe advertising a new album that was coming out, they would do a tour of the cities, and they would invite along your um, newspaper, TV, radio, and your music store owners to come along, almost almost like a listening party. You could hear the new album. You could maybe speak to the, the band or the artist and yep. make connections that way. And that's kind of how you almost kind of your stepping stone into the, the radio thing. But you said something that was absolutely amazing because I don't think it would happen nowadays. And what you'd said was Richard Park, who was the boss of Radio Clyde, you got speaking to him and he'd said to you, just from speaking with you, um, he gave you the opportunity to, I think maybe to learn for a few weeks, but give you the opportunity for a, a radio show on a Friday night, late at night, to play rock music because you were saying, there was a lot of people saying, why don't they play this, 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 this? And he admittedly said to himself, he didn't think rock music was a was a popular thing, or it was maybe like a fad that would go away. And it, but he still put trust in someone who didn't have any radio experience to play songs that he himself didn't like. I don't even know if that would happen nowadays. Unlikely, very unlikely nowadays. That, that was pretty. You missed amazing. one small point you, you you missed the first time the first meeting with with Richard when uh, we got chatting at one of these record company days. Um, I actually said to him, "Why do you never play any rock music on on, on Radio Clyde? I listen to Clyde quite often, and you never ever would hear a rock song." And he would say, oh, rock music is a minority, tiny minority. Uh, here today, gone tomorrow, all these bands. Are <laughs> and, and, of course, some of the bands that I played in the 80s, that uh, <laughs> my boss, you know, your Bon Jovi, your Guns N' Roses, Aerosmith, uh, etc., are still around to this day, still uh, making albums and, and still giving a lot of pleasure to a lot of folk. And some lots of the bands that he was playing during the day, all the pop bands that he was playing, like Steps, have just faded into to, uh, relative obscurity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the first time I, I spoke to him about it, um, he, he, he more or less dismissed it. But I think it was maybe the third of these record company dudes. They used to have them every two or three weeks uh, in different hotels in Glasgow. And... Uh, the second time I met him at the second one of these things, the, the, there was a little bit of banter between us. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be slagging off the pop stuff that he'd be playing and he would be slagging off these bands that I'm talking about. Like, why do you ever play ACDC? And he would say, oh, ACDC. Give them six months and they'll be forgotten about. Yeah. Aye, sure. Um, and I think it was the third after the third meeting that I had with him, uh, he phoned me out the blue and just said, uh, do you want to come in for a chat? I've been thinking about what you were saying and um, I'd like to give you a wee six-week trial yeah. uh, on a Friday night. Um, Played your own stuff and we'll see how it goes. Uh, and the radio <laughs> career started there and then. But that really is amazing, though, because he's, you know, you've got to know him, but he knows you don't have any experience and he himself didn't like the songs, but he obviously trusted, like, there's something here that I don't understand, but I think, let's give it a chance. Mm. I don't know if they would give it a chance nowadays. Unlikely. Uh, Unlikely. Uh, the, way, the way radio, the, the way the whole radio market in the UK has, has changed beyond all recognition. Um, what I've just described there, I think you're probably right, Ian, it, it wouldn't happen because now it's all run from London. Uh, yeah. most, most of the shows you listen to on the commercial stations here in Scotland, the, yeah. the music's coming from London. But here's a question then, and this kind of links back to what we were speaking about earlier. So I'll give you an example. So I, I, I play in the pubs, you know, guitar, singing, um, just make a bit of extra money. And I've spoke with quite a few friends about this. Now, if there's, a, if there's a new song, a new album that comes out, um, I won't name any artists, but let's say it's somebody that, that's popular just now. If they a really big song, you learn to play it, 
and you'll play it in the pub for the next six months, maybe a year, and it goes down absolutely great. You know that if there's if there's students in, if there's a crowd of people in, this song is going to go down well if you play it. See, after about a year, it's got a shelf life. After a year, it sounds tired, right? Mm-hmm. But you go and play a song that's 40 or 50 years old and it, it goes down maybe even better today than it went down 40, 50 years ago. It's just as popular. Why is it that new song, what is it that's missing from new songs that the old songs have still got? I know there is a bit of nostalgia there, but there, there mm. must be something else. I don't, I don't think there's anything missing. I, I think probably because they're not hearing these songs. Let's let's say you, you did uh, Living on a Prayer, Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. Um, the majority of your audience in the pub know the song. They've, had, they've heard the song. They probably know the, the chorus of it. Oh, yeah, halfway there. Um, but they haven't heard it that week. They haven't heard it that month. And because of the way people consume music now, uh, less and less people are listening to radio and when they do listen to radio they're just hearing the same 20 or 40 songs rotated yeah. over and over and over again so perhaps they, the, the four guys sitting in the front row at your gig haven't heard Living in a Prayer for six months maybe six months since they last heard that song but you play it, they know the words and they're yeah, halfway there yeah That's true. I mean I had someone on previously who, who they were a big pop fan but they were a pop fan. What they'd say was, I'm a pop fan of music from the 70s and 80s. And he said, now, pop music in the 70s and 80s is very different to pop music nowadays. Mm-hmm. And, and even back then, pop music would have still been bands writing the songs, playing them. Mm-hmm. He says, nowadays, you've got a boy band that'll come out and then they'll last for four or five years and then they'll be replaced with another boy band that's pretty much just a, the same as what was before. And, you know, it's a weird one. I mean, somebody is making a lot of money somewhere off mm. the back of it. But, it, I mean, don't get me wrong, there is a, there is songs that, that's come through and, and you think to yourself, that's going to still be getting played yes. 20 or 30 years' time, but it, it's not the same as as the ones. I mean, you go and play Don McLean's American Pie, every time you get to that chorus, the mm. whole pub erupts. Mm-hmm. Don't know Lulu, Lulu Shout. Yeah. So, yeah. As <laughs> soon as you start playing that, I can imagine the place that just and that's from the sixties. So that's what sixty nearly sixty years sixty years old that song. Yeah. It's weird that I'll play songs and there'll be songs that I think this is going to go down great and for whatever reason it doesn't it doesn't work. And then there'll be songs that I'm, i think is a bit of a filler and it, it goes down great and there's songs that you know you don't think people are going to even know. Rick, you'll play a Ricky Nelson song and it goes down amazing compared, compared to something like, I don't know, like The Killers or something a lot more recent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's odd, but here's a, I'll get your opinion on this, right? So when you think of older bands, the, you know, let's say the 60s when you, when you were talking about when you are kind of getting into music, right? The Beatles, The Doors, The Who, Rolling Stones, Creedence, all these bands, right? They all write these amazing albums, these amazing songs, the technology that they're using back then, the recording technology was so unbelievably primitive, it almost forced the bands into being as creative, creative as they possibly could be. And nowadays, when you look at recording gear, not only is it accessible, but uh, you can pretty much do whatever you want. You can do anything with it. Do you think that's maybe made some of the songwriting a bit lazy or for, for current bands? A little bit la- lazy, but certainly a lot of the the modern pop songs, which I, I don't tend to listen to very, mu- very much, but when you do hear them, um, there's a similarity about them. Um, is it AI, they call it, the, the, this new thing, or I? Is, is it AI? Yeah, artificial intelligence uh, the, 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 they're using to, to, to make a lot of these uh, tunes and there's a similarity and there's a similar sort of mic sound they tend to get uh, the, the, I mean, and I mean, a lot of that pop stuff um, whereas a lot of the rock artists you, you'll know as well as I do 
mm-hmm. will are, are fed up doing that, and they're now going back to this analog recording and trying to yeah. replicate what people did in the sixties and seventies, four track, reel to reel, rather than on a computer. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of bands. You think of all those bands years ago? A lot of them had to play live in the studio. They mic'd everything up, they hit record, and they would use an overdub to maybe correct one a little mistake or something. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. They had to know the song inside out. They had to be able to play it. I think there's a lot of bands nowadays that they've never played the song start to finish mm-hmm. in the actual studio just because of the way they record. But, you know, they'll record to a clip track and it'll be sonically amazing. It'll sound... It's almost like it sounds too perfect. It loses the spark or it loses something. Loses the soul. Yeah. Soul of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But um, it's almost like... You, you can be too good sounding, mm-hmm. and uh, it, it's it's weird. But I, as you say, there is a lot of bands going back. It's funny you say that. I've got a friend who who's a he's a a lecturer, a, mu- a sound technician lecturer, and he does a lot of uh, recordings. He actually went and bought himself a reel to reel tape, like proper old school cut and splice when you're uh, mixing and all that sort of stuff, and and. Uh, He's just, he, I've, I've not seen it yet, but he's, he's messaged me a few times just seeing the sound he gets from this. You can't recreate it digitally. I mean, you can get close to it, but there, there's just something that, that's cool. Mm-hmm. I think Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters done a big documentary about trying to save a sound desk um, from one of the main studios in LA that had been used to record millions of bands that it was closing down. He wanted to keep it or something like that. Um I don't know, but uh, it's, it's an interesting to think of anyway, but obviously you've been in the business for a long, long time. I know that you've interviewed, I don't even know how many people you've interviewed, bands, musicians. Um, I know you'd obviously said your favourite person to get uh, to interview was Ozzy. Still one of the favourites. Or, or, or one of them was uh-huh. Ozzy. And uh, you'd said there was a couple, you know, lots of memorable ones. Two of them was when there was a new band just about to release their debut album and you got to meet three of the members and it turned out to be Guns N' Roses. Appetite was just about to come out. Yes, that was in London. Um, yeah, and what they'd said to you was they were uh, loving the fact that you were from Scotland mm-hmm. because they loved Nazareth. Their favourite band, was, it was actual. <laughs> Axel's favourite band was, was Nazareth. That's brilliant. Uh, forgive the American... Uh, the poor American accent, but I could still see him when I was shown into the hotel room to do this interview. They were actually they had a, a boombox, a cassette player sitting in the corner. It was playing a, a Nazareth Greatest Hits album or cassette, and uh, introductions were done. This is Tom. He's come down from Glasgow. This is Axel. This is Slash. This is Duff. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Uh, is that a bit of Nazareth you're playing there? And Axel says, "Gee, man." You're Scottish. <laughs> I said, yeah. Gee, did you know Nazareth? And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. The pal of me, Pete and, and, and Dan and, and Billy, I've known them for a few years. Do you think if we ever play Scotland, do you think you could get us to meet Nazareth? I think I'll see what I can do. But then <laughs> that, never, that never happened. But uh, The other story was obviously like... Uh, Helping, helping some young musicians um, when it started to snow. Oh, <laughs> that was uh, in the early 80s, about 83, 84, something like that. And Wreck a Company phoned me and said, uh, we've got this American band we've just signed, first album, can, yep. can we send you up a, a white label? This was like a, a promotional copy of the, the, yep. the first album. And I said, ah, of course. So they sent it up, I listened to it, and right away you knew this is really, really, really good. So the girl phoned me up a couple of days later and said, have you had a listen? What do you think? I said, oh, that's really good. She said, oh, we've got them coming over uh, next month to um, to tour. It's going to be their first UK tour. And uh, they're going to be supporting Kiss. They're playing right. a show in Glasgow at the Apollo. Um, how would you like to do an interview? And I said, of course, yes. Right. Great. So all the arrangements were made, and I think it was either the, the Glasgow show was either the first or the second show of the tour. Yep. 
So the band arrived at uh, Radio Clyde's building in the afternoon. It was a pre-record. They were playing later that night. So they arrived about maybe three, three o'clock in the afternoon. And they came in, just nice young American guys in their 20s, you know, and all excited. And they're, gee, is this, uh, this is, we're in Glasgow. Is this, is it true what they say that this is a place, forgive the American accent, <laughs> is, is it true that this is the place that, that Angus and Malcolm came from? And I saw, yeah. uh, they were born on the other side of town um, in a place called Cran Hill. Oh, wow. Oh, they're all excited. We went in and did the interview. And smashing. They were, they were quite, the American bands were always coached. They were always taught how to do interviews, how to answer the questions, and, and you know, and not just have a carry on. Quite often, the British bands. We were just having a laugh, just to carry on, and, and it didn't always work. But the American bands were always very professional. So we did the interview, finished the, finished recording on a reel-to-reel, and uh, just shooting the breeze for 10 minutes. They were just asking me about the, the music scene in the UK and all the rest yep. of it. And then their, their road manager came through and said, listen, we'll need to, to get back in um, to do our sound check. At the Apollo, we're playing the Glasgow Apollo, and it started to snow. Oh, all right, okay. So <laughs> we finish our coffees and we we'll go out, and there's a photographs taken and hands sh- shaking. And nice to meet you. We'll see you later on at the show. Hopefully you're coming. I said yes. Thank you. I'm on the guest list, and uh, it'd been quite a heavy snow shower, so there was maybe half an inch of snow um, in the Radio Clyde car park. And the band get into the little sort of minibus, minibus thing, and the driver, the tour, ma- the tour manager, he, he was obviously not used to driving in the snow. He had no idea, yeah. you know, and he's accelerating, and the, the wheels are spinning round. <laughs> <laughs> the minibus is flying about all over the place. Um, so they get out. The, the the guys from the band get out, and. Uh, Myself, the three of them, and John McCallman, who was the head of production at Clyde, we're pushing this minibus out of the Radio Clyde Park car park. Yep. And to, to my eternal shame, I didn't have a camera. I wish I'd had a camera that day because it was John Bon Jovi, Richie Sambora, and uh, Dave Bryan, the keyboard player, was the three guys that did the interview. Um, and every time from that day till relatively recently any time I've interviewed Bon Jovi they always remind me about that and say ah you're the guy that got it's definitely a good reminder uh, for them but I don't know how many people you have have interviewed and spoke to across the years but is there any band or artist that you never got the opportunity to or you just never crossed paths with them somebody that you start on your bucket list of people to speak to that you would still like to do um, Hendrix, I would like to, to have uh, chatted with Hendrix. Yeah. Um, Jimmy Page, met Jimmy Page once, but never, never got to interview him. Um, who else? Did, uh, Cream, Cream were a band I always loved, and uh, right. uh, Ginger Baker, the, the drummer, was well known in the music business. <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of a uh, didn't suffer fools g- gladly. Didn't particularly enjoy doing interviews, so I, I don't think I would have enjoyed interviewing him. Um, Jack Bruce I interviewed once. He was from Bishop Briggs, strangely enough, for my. Right. That's, he was born in Bishop Briggs. Interviewed him, and, and and he was cool. But Clapton, I never got to interview. Never never met Clapton, and always regretted that. Up until five or six years ago, Clapton was playing at the Hydro in Glasgow. Right, okay. And uh, just my sellout show. And he, again, he's got a wee bit of a reputation of being a wee bit of a grumpy old sod. <laughs> yeah. So he did about, I think, maybe 45 minutes of the show. And it was good. And he was playing mm-hmm. a selection of old stuff and new stuff. And then maybe, maybe after 50 minutes, there was a buzzing noise came from one side of the PA and really loud. Yeah. Uh, it was obviously a technical a technical yeah. uh, problem. And Clapton took his guitar off and slammed it down 
And so, never said a word, just took his guitar off in the middle of the song, slammed it onto the the the, uh, the, the stage and stormed off. The rest of the band, who included um, Andy Fairweather Low um, mm-hmm. from Amen Corner, he was, he was yep. in the band, and somebody else, what was the, the singer's name? Oh, can't remember. Um, they carried on uh, and sang yeah. the song without Clapton. And then I think it was Andy Fairweather Lowson came up to the, the mic and said, sorry folks, the technical hitches you can hear, uh, but don't worry, we'll be back. Yeah. So the audience, the crowd thought, well, that'll be okay. That's okay, no, no problem. So they, off, they went off the stage, maybe 10, 15 minutes. So we'd had 45 to 50 minutes of the concert. Yeah. After maybe 15, 20 minutes, the technical boys had managed to get the the PA sorted. Yeah. The band came back on and um, got, got their instruments sorted. Uh, Clapton came back on, never said a word, just went in and did... Now, I can't remember if it was one or two songs, and that was it. Yeah. And they went off. And the crowd were, well, well surely, we've had less than an hour entertainment for our 80 quid or whatever it was for the ticket. Surely it'll come on and do a bit of yeah. an encore. And they screened for an encore for maybe five minutes, and then the lights came on. And the crowd changed just like that. Just they changed from "Come on, give us an encore, yeah, more" to "Boo!" And I actually saw guys in front of me t- taking their Clapton t-shirts off that they had paid forty quid for earlier on at yep. the entire stall. They were taking these t-shirts off and throwing them on stage and storming off and off. And I thought, you know, I'm glad I never interviewed Clapton because if it'd been like that. I don't know how how to react. Yeah, it's one of those ones that uh, I mean, I want. I wonder, you know, I, I don't know, but maybe, maybe some people get bored with it. It just becomes a job rather than a passion <laughs> or a hobby. Because yeah. I can remember, um, I'm still charging eighty pound. Uh, yeah. There's ten thousand people there. Yeah, <laughs> not a bad job making that sort of, the sort of money that he's making. Yeah, I mean, I remember watching a, a documentary with the the drummer. It was a documentary with the surviving members of the Doors, and uh, I think it was either the drummer or the guitarist was saying that they, they sometimes get jealous because they see like a band like the Stones, who are still going, they're still playing. Now they're not playing because they need the money. They're, mm-hmm. they're playing purely because they love being up on that stage for mm-hmm. those two hours. They are having the time of their life still after all these years, and they were saying that they get jealous that. You know, for such a big band, they, they only got about four or five years mm-hmm. before before their band was over. And they see other bands, especially nowadays, people take care of themselves a bit better and le- less drinking drugs. So, you know, you can... You, can you wonder how many other 80-year-olds can bounce about for nearly two hours. Yeah. Like Mick Jagger can do. It's incredible. 80, it's incredible. And yeah. considering that probably back in the day... Uh, he probably did misuse them, his, his body, you know, drinking drugs and things. But, yeah. Uh, but um, here's a question then for you. So I think, like like myself, you like the rock and the metal music, right? Um, how do you see festivals continuing in the future? So I was talking with someone just the other day about this, and what we were saying was you've got download coming up, and it's usually two or, th- two or three nights um, that you'll have um, you'll have your main act headlining you've got all the smaller acts the side stages all that sort of thing but when you th- if you think about the next 15 years the likelihood is Iron Maiden are probably going to be gone at some point mm. in the next 15 years which is a shame but mm. unfortunately that's just what happened mm. possibly Metallica are going to be gone mm-hmm. you're going to have like your Aerosmith your Kiss your Guns N' Roses all, all these but, bands are all Either already on the way out, or or they're, or they're probably only maybe got ten years left in them, fifteen years at the most. Their band, those bands, can pull in crowds of fifty thousand or more, right? 
All the bands that are lower down are all exceptionally brilliant bands. And, and they've got careers where they can travel the world selling out 3,000 seat, seat arenas perfectly fine. What's going to happen? Do you think that, that they'll have to make it more mainstream? And I don't mean this in a bad way, but will, will it be bands maybe like Foo Fighters, that some, a wee bit more mainstream that can pull in the bigger crowds? Or do you think it will... I, I don't see... The way the music industry is went, I don't see a band being able to achieve, um, a heavy metal band being able to achieve, achieve the same success as Metallica nowadays in terms of how big they got. Very good question, Ian. And, and I've actually discussed this on numerous occasions uh, with Andy Coppin, who runs Download. Um, and he's worried sick about it, and it has been for a number of years. Um, the lack of newer bands coming yeah. through the, not, at, at that level. Yeah, I mean, it, I, get, not, it's not lack of talent. Because oh, no, it, no, no, no. It's, it's, it's what, the, what the, the number of tickets, I mean, he's interested in yeah. selling uh, 100,000 tickets for the weekend. And I don't, so I don't know if this is all his expenses. But if he, yeah. so if he doesn't sell 100,000 tickets, the thing can lose money. And obviously, if it loses money, it's not going to last very long. There's this other band, I mean, Ramstein, for example, the, the yeah. German band. But again, they're, they're, they're not youngsters. Blackstone no. Ferry and Shinedown, people thought were going to, but I don't think either of them are going to reach that I mean, level. No, Same no. with Avenged Sevenfold, they, re, they, they reckoned that they were, and they're on this, uh, this time. But I don't think they're. I don't think it's the, the, they're not an Iron Maiden. They're not a, a Motley Crue. I mean, the only one I can think of, the, the, the other one that's still on the go, is Slipknot. <laughs> but, even, but even they have been on the go for 20 years, albeit they're, they're yeah. changing, changing members and they might be getting younger people in. So, but, I mean, the, you can't have them headline every single year. Correct, correct. You know? It's, it's a problem. It's a problem. And I... I on my radio career, I've, I've tried very hard in my whole career since 1980 for what, nearly 45 years now. Um, whether I'm doing one show a week as I am now, just to sort of keep my hand on, or yeah. seven shows a week that, like I used to do 10, 10 years ago, I've always, always, always... It's, it's wonderful to hear Stairway to Heaven, Freebird, Sweet Child of Mine. Yep. But you can't just keep the same over and over and over again. You've got to open your ears and have a wee listen to the those damn crows or um, you know bands like that. The, the new Scarlet Rebels, another one. Uh, the, the new bands that are coming through, bands coming out of America. A lot of good rock bands coming out of uh, Sweden and Finland and Norway and even Germany, uh, yeah. Australia. Canada. There's some great, great bands come out of Canada recently. Uh, the, the, what do you call them? The Sheepdogs, um, etc. You've, it's down to us, the, the, the paying public, to give these newer bands a listen. Give them a chance. And they could, I'm not saying they will, I'm saying there's a possibility that they, given the chance, they can grow into an Iron Maiden or a Metallica or a Motley Crue. If we don't give them a chance, then the whole thing will just die. I mean, you've obviously done doing the radio. I started doing this, and it's, it's purely for, for fun on my part, but it's a great way to discover new bands. If, if I can help promote them, you know, brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, it, but, I mean, there, there's bands. I think you're the 36th guest that I've had on, and... Um, there, there's bands that I've spoke to that I would never have spoken to before. And, you know, it's great to, to discover new music, but it, it's difficult as well because you, you would think with the way that, um, the way you can access music nowadays online, you, you know, but it's almost like there's so much of it, it's hard to for the good ones to kind of come to the top. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, but it is what it is. But uh, obviously you still work, as you say, you're doing one. Is it one show a week that you do? Yeah, I do a show on Celtic Music Radio. When when I, I was working for a, a, a station based in Glasgow called the Max, which yeah. was uh, it was terrific. Three years with that, but uh, COVID just killed it. As you can imagine, any any radio station, the, the overheads are pretty pretty high. Especially the Max were doing it really well. 
good radio programs and uh, vi- interviews. Any interviews that I was doing, they were videoing the interviews as well and putting them up on the website. So, right. you know, so it wasn't just one hit. If you listen to it on the radio, fine. If you miss it on the radio, you've missed it. You can mm-hmm. watch the video anytime you like on the website. Yeah. But because it was costing whatever it was costing to, to run the ra- radio station, and uh, then COVID hit and everything closed down and the sales reps from the Max are going into potential advertisers and saying, would you like to advertise with us? And yeah. saying, no, <laughs> we've got no money coming in either. Um, yeah. So COVID killed the Max. Uh, and I was really sad about that. I thought the Max had a, a lot of potential. So I thought, right, I'm, I'm getting to an age where it would be nice to maybe put my feet up <laughs> um, to get a little bit more easy. Uh, but um, I got a phone call just a couple of weeks after the Max had, had uh, folded from uh, an old pal, pal of mine, Gordon Hodgkiss, who works for uh, Celtic Music Radio. Right. Uh, they've been going about 20 years in Glasgow. Very popular, doing mainly traditional Scottish music, mm-hmm. uh, Chukta music, uh, folk music, Celtic music, all that sort of stuff. And he says, um, he's, he's actually a director of the company, and he, he says, do you fancy, I, I hear the Max is gone, Tom, would you like fancy doing a show once a week just to keep your eye in? And I said, oh, God, no, I love Celtic music, I love Run, Run Rig and Carla yeah. Kelly and all these bands, I, I think they're great. Um, in fact, me and you, Gordon, me and you have been drunk together a few of these uh, <laughs> that you've taken me to but I like it but I don't know enough about it to do a radio programme about it yeah. and he says no no Tom no 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 we'd like you to do a Tom Russell rock show right uh, oh no restrictions no no you play what you like Tom do that I do that on a Thursday night 10 o'clock till midnight yeah. you can get it on DAB it's on 95 FM in Glasgow and it's on Alexa, it's on an online. So, in fact, I'll tell you a quick story. Um, just last week, it, it was lovely. On the Friday morning after I'd done the show on the Thursday night, there's a, a message through Facebook. Um, Hi, Tom, uh, so-and-so, I can't remember his name, so-and-so here. Um, just to say I was listening to your show last night, um, and it brought back some lovely memories. Uh, I... He was born and bred in Bishop Briggs. I used to come into your record shop, and I used to I used to listen to your Friday rock show every single week on Radio Clyde, right through the eighties and the nineties. Late nineties, I moved to Germany, where I am to this day, and uh, I'm also a fan of Celtic music. So yep. last night I was listening to Celtic music radio. Mm-hmm. Hadn't a clue that you were on it, <laughs> and at ten o'clock you appeared. And I sat there and it was lovely. It was like, listen, bringing back my childhood from my 80s and my 90s. So it's wonderful. We're talking about technology earlier on. Yeah. Technology has enabled somebody to sit in Germany and listen to a wee yeah. radio station in Glasgow. Terrific. Yeah, I mean, even just doing what we're doing just now, I initially started this out and, and the original idea was simply just for me to speak with local musicians in the, in the central Scotland belt. And then as it kind of picked up a bit of momentum, I thought, you know, maybe I'll spread my wings a little bit and see if I get some bands from maybe Ireland, England. And, uh, and the, you know, there's been bands in America and Australia, Colombia, it's starting to kind of go all over the place, but it's so easy to do with, mm-hmm. you know, with a relatively simple setup. But talking about um, Scottish music there, that seems to be coming back. Like there's been a resurgence with that. Um, there's a lot of really good Scottish bands mm-hmm. that are co- that have came out in the last five or six years. I had the, one of the, the drummer from Pete and Diesel mm-hmm. uh, was on. Uh, they're currently doing an English tour, but they're back home in July. So the Innes, the accordion players, coming on. Um, Rumac, who's I don't know if you've heard of him, the accordion guy. Uh, he's a bit of a madman. He's been on. I've got, um, I think, tomorrow, uh, I can't remember his name, the singer of Rhythm and Real. Uh, he's coming on. There's a lot of Scottish bands that are, that are starting to come out. And what's really good about it is being in Scotland, you're so used to liking bands from America. You get to see them once every five years when they, they tour through Scotland. Mm-hmm. 
and when you like a band from Scotland, you get to see them two or three times in the same year. It's a nice change mm-hmm, mm-hmm. from having to wait for these bands from across the water to actually uh, to come over. You were saying there about accordion, uh, just uh, a bit of mischief popped into my head. Um, I think we've all been probably watching a little bit of television recently with, with uh, the Donald in America and his trial. And the funniest thing I saw during the trial was one of the commentators talking about uh, Donald Trump obviously is, was a frustrated accordion player. player. Hold on, I think I've lost your no, audio. Uh, it just went close. They, they, they reckoned that, that Donald Trump was a frustrated accordion <laughs> player. And, uh, <laughs> well, he goes, and they're all against me, and everybody's out to get me. <laughs> You may be probably fine. He's maybe got perfect technique for it. <laughs> and every time you, I watch him from that day to this, you, you can actually see it. <laughs> but uh, Tom, we've obviously been uh, quite serious up to this point, quite a lot of technical chit-chat for all the musicians and that out there. So I'm going to end things with asking you some fun questions. Right, so imagine that you could uh, go back in time. You could go anywhere in the world. What's the one, either big concert, small gig, what's the one gig that you wish that you could have attended and witnessed? Hmm. Jimi Hendrix and Pink Floyd at the Greens Playhouse in Glasgow in the mid-60s. Well, was that with Sid Barrett? Yes. And it was a, the headline act was Engelbert Humperdinck. Engelbert Humperdinck, Pink Floyd and Jimi Hendrix. I think there's a picture of that and I think the Beatles and all that were there to see it as well. Probably at the London show they'd be at. Yeah. But they played the the early Pink Floyd. Which went on to become the Apollo. Yeah, that would have been cool. Right. Obviously you're a man on the radio so you have listened to probably thousands of amazing great songs across the years. What's the one song that you wish you could have sat in the recording studio to watch the band or the artist actually record it? It's so hard. That, that's like getting asked your favourite song and it's a hard one. It's really difficult to answer. Oh, or a couple. Um, Give us a couple. Um, Iron Maiden, Fear of the Dark right. and Metallica, The Unforgiven. Yeah, that would have been cool. That would have been cool. And uh, last question for you, Tom. Mount Rushmore, who is the four bands or musicians for yourself, whether it be songwriting, whether it be performing, whether it just be the overall package, who are the four at the top of your list that are perfection for yourself? Vocals, Robert Plant. Yeah. Guitar... It's so difficult. I just love guitars. Who will I pick as guitarist? Maybe come back to that one. Um, Drums. Ted McKenna. I thought Ted McKenna was just incredible. Bass guitar. Because I've said Ted McKenna, I'd I'd maybe say Chris Glenn from the Sensational Alex Harvey Band, yes. or Gary Lee from Rush, yes. brilliant bass player, um, or what's his name from Mr. Big? Um, memory's going to my old age. Um, back to guitarist, guitarist. There's so many, and they're so different depending on what decade you pick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Jeff Beck. Um, Slash. Joe Bonamassa. Bernie Marsden. Uh, Pat McManus from Mama's Boys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's hard to say one. Hard to say cool. one. That was the last question, but I'm going to actually ask you one more. You've obviously been listening to music across the years. Is there any 
type of music that you're not a fan of that, that you would stay clear of from mm. listening? <laughs> Rock music, is, as you're well aware, is, is such a wide... I mean, people use the word heavy metal. Uh, and it used to drive me up the wall back in the, in the day when I would, would talk about, oh, that's Tom Russell, he plays all that heavy metal stuff on, on, on his rock show. Well, yes, I do, but I also play punk rock, I play pop rock, I play uh, blues rock, uh, I play jazz rock, <laughs> all types of rock. And I like it, I like it all. But what do I not like? Don't mind jazz. I, I like new country. I'm not that keen on old country and western. I like new country. Um, classical, probably if, if you'd asked me that question 20, 30 years ago, I'd have said, I can't be bothered with classical. But I must admit, in, in recent years, hearing the, the odd, it's not my favourite, but you, you can appreciate what the hell, that was, that was written 350 years ago, and it still yeah. sounds fabulous. It's uh, funny, funny that you say it because uh, obviously at the moment it's a lot of interviews that I'm kind of doing on the podcast, but I've got a few other ideas coming up, and I've got a friend coming over, he was on a previous episode, and he's really into rap music, which is just something I have never, ever got into, and uh, but he's never got into heavy metal music. So we're going to sit down, see if we can convince the other one. We'll, we'll, I don't know, select, I don't know, we've not worked out yet. We'll select seven or eight songs and see if we can convert the other person um, with a style that we don't normally listen to. I'll tell you a quick, quick, quick story on that. I was quite lucky in, in, in back in the 80s and 90s because there wasn't that many outlets for rock music in Britain on the radio. I yep. was just one of a, a handful. I, I used to get, you know, the good interviews that, that I wouldn't get if I was just starting off nowadays. But a uh, record company phoned me up, up and said, Tom, we've got an interview, but you need to take a couple of days off your work. Is that okay? I am self-employed. So they flew me over to Los, Los Angeles uh, to interview uh, Rick Rubin, right. uh, uh, who was oh, is one of the world's top Producers, he's produced ACDC, Johnny Cash, Metallica, oh, yeah, uh, an, an amazing producer. So to do an interview with him and with Slayer, uh, yeah. and stay there for a couple of days. Uh, so <laughs> I was, didn't, didn't pay anything for it, but it's not a bad way of spending a couple of days. Yeah. And I can remember having a, a, a chat with, with Rick uh, long after we'd done, we did the interview in the morning and that night he took me out for dinner and uh, and a few drinks and we're chatting away and chatting about music and he he says, what do you think about um, rap and hip hop? And I said, oh, this is, I can't remember, late 80s, early 90s and I said, no, nah, not really. He said, uh, mark my words, it's the future. Yeah. And I was I was quite surprised that I'm saying that because uh, he, he, to my mind, he was a rock producer. Um, yeah. The Cult was another band he produced, um, but he was proven right. When you when yeah. you look at what what's happened, um, very very few of the classic rock radio stations, especially in America, even exist now. They're, they're all playing hop, uh, hip hop. He seems to be right. quite a he seems to be quite a fascinating guy because you see him in interviews and he, you know he'll be sitting producing a band and he might not be a fan of that music but he's he's got a good enough ear to that he, he seems to say do more of that do less of that mm -hmm. even though it's maybe not a style but in some ways it's very much good music is good music mm -hmm. the who it is that's recording it or releasing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. If it's a good song, it's a good song. Mm -hmm. But, yep. uh, Tom, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. And you, Ian. And, Thanks um, for inviting me. No, that's fine. Have you got any other plans for the rest of the year? We're halfway through the year now. Um, this sort of uh, convalescence thing that I'm going through, get, <laughs> um, get that... Uh, Get, get that behind me and just start 
But uh, looking forward to winter storm again this year. The festival down in Trun that they have every every year in November. Yeah, yeah. they get me to comp- compare that. So and there's some good bands up here again this year. So looking forward to that and, and getting back into going to concerts and just just live the rest of my life with, yeah, some, great, with some great memories. You never know. We'll maybe meet up at a concert um, next time. There's maybe a big rock one in Glasgow or something. Sounds good. And if anybody wants to buy my book, it's still available. It's called The Godfather of Rock. Where uh, can they get it? Easy. Well, all the libraries have Every- it. Uh, you can go into a bookstore, and if they don't have it in stock, they can order it for you, and it takes a couple of days. Or you can um, come onto my Facebook thing, and uh, I've got a pile there I can autograph and post, post them out to So. Links for buying a book, links to the radio station, all of it is on your social media. It's easy enough to find. So if anyone's looking for it, just check it out there. But uh, Tom, thank you so much for coming on. And uh, I hope you have fun in your, your semi-retirement. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, Ian. Keep the fire burning. Thank you. <laughs>